Welcome to another episode of the Snap No Tap podcast. Tony Cicchini here with Joe Cardinal. And sorry that this week's was delayed a couple of days, a few days, but sometimes we work around our special guests. And today we have an absolutely extra special guest. I'm going to get to him in a moment, but let me just start by prefacing that he's probably what, if not the longest or oldest martial art related friend that I have. He's He's got to be up there. Um, I've known him forever, it seems. Um, and he is unquestionably the finest kickboxer that I've ever personally met. He's amazing. Uh, we actually did a video series together 100 years ago, Catching Kickboxing. Um, and he's also, I'll let him tell his resume, but he's the inheritor of, you know, the, the superfoot systems of Bill Wallace. He's Bill Wallace's right-hand guy, and Bill's an awesome guy as well. We used to do seminars together, but um, we'll, we're going to get to him in a second. But we we have to do our, our local uh, news uh, updates here. I had the delayed seminar. I had to do it Sunday um, at the Krav Maga class uh, or school. And just a shout out to the guys. So hello, thanks for being there again. Uh, and uh, Joe, what what are the updates that 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 you have? No real updates. Obviously, we're going to have another seminar uh, at Jason Bender Martial Arts and Fitness in November. I'm imagining it's going to be the 19th. Just looking at the calendar, but we'll have to coordinate that and we'll make it definitive. We'll post that once we know for sure. So stay tuned for that news. Uh, we had our first one and I think it went really well. Um, a few new guys. So it was a good kind of intro class for them and some some uh, old old timers like uh, Joe Dankowski and Bender were there as well. So it was a good time. Yeah, we have the Serbian national wrestling Greco guys, two of them on the national wrestling team, phenomenal athletes. Uh, yeah, and I believe that Chuck May wants to continue on the third Sundays. Again, last week got screwed up. Apparently, many of the Krav guys had to do their black belt test. And what happens with the black belt, first of all, it was some other, it was not in Illinois. And it's a six-hour nonstop test. So you get pretty banged up and tired. And, you know, that's, that's a lot on you. So they needed some recoup time. So hence why we had to postpone it a week. But um, so what we're trying to do is to keep the thing going. Saturdays at Bender Fitness and Martial Arts and then Sundays at the DuPage Krav Maga School. But when it comes to seminars, when it comes to, to most things, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give the, the, the best introduction I can. He's the second best looking martial artist that ever lived behind Joe Cardinal, of course, which we all are. But outside of his looks, his legs, his kicks, his his martial arts ability, he's not second to anybody. He's my dear friend, great martial artist, Mr. Terry Dow. My God, welcome to the podcast. We've been wanting you for the longest period of time. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here and uh, excited you guys are doing a podcast. Uh, Tony, I always try to keep up with, with what you're doing. You know, no matter how much time goes in between us talking, um, I always talk about you. I promote you in different seminars when I get a chance to teach a few things Thanks. that you showed me and uh, and always checking in on you and referring people to the videos. And, uh, and then lately, some of our catch and kickboxing has been popping up, which, you know, it's, uh, it's cool. But then you watch people with their comments. It drives me nuts so i try not to read them <laughs> oh really they do the trash talking i don't go to facebook i don't do facebook <laughs> it's all good man so how you guys doing 
Really good. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks, Joe. You too. Well, this is, like I said, it's my first time meeting you. So kind of let's dig right in. I, I really don't have much background on you. How did you, how, where are you from? How did you get started? What did you do growing up? How did you get involved in the martial arts? Uh, I am in uh, New Hampshire, in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. I got started in martial arts when I was nine. Uh, I had an older half brother that was uh, 12 years older than me, six foot six, 260 pounds, size 13 work boots. And uh, he did martial arts and he thought it was fun to, uh, you know, spar, I guess you would call it with me. Um, <laughs> I was probably, you know, at, at eight or nine and he was, you know, 19 or 20. And, uh, and it was a very painful experience but we we continued to do it and then he got me into you know um my interest in martial arts and then i thought you know i better learn something so he doesn't kick the crap out of me every week um so i started in kempo karate as a as a kid and then in my late teenage years my instructor knew that i loved sparring and kicking and he started um you know got me kind of turned on to the bill superfoot wallace's videos and I just absolutely loved it. You know, I'd had a bunch of different coaches that I worked with and, um, you know, some of the things work and some of the things weren't my personal um, the psychology, the way that I like to approach fighting. It just didn't kind of fit me. And then uh, when I met Bill at a seminar, because I could already, you know, do the kicks to the head and had good flexibility from working on his videos, we hit it off right away. I asked him about training with him and he said, come to LA. And I thought it was probably a blow off or something because I had never met a celebrity before. And at this point, I was uh, I think I had just turned 20. And um, so he gave me a phone number and I, I called. It was his personal number. We talked and we set up uh, some training in between my um, sophomore and junior years of college. I went out to Los Angeles. I lived with him, trained at Penny the Jets Jet Center. Uh, we did two hour privates every day for a month and uh, an hour of conditioning and an hour of sparring and just became best friends. And um, yeah, and I've sort of grown into uh, vice president of the organization, the technical director, and we currently have 37 Superfoot affiliate schools that I work with every month. So yeah, that's kind of a summary in a nutshell, I guess. <laughs> wow. That's got to be mind blowing to have a you know a celebrity like that take you under his wing. You know that's that's pretty awesome opportunity. Very much, man. I, I feel very lucky um, or fortunate that I've, I've had those opportunities. Um, and I think it was Steve Lefebvre that brought Tony out to New Hampshire for a seminar, and I first met him, and I was actually wearing my Superfoot shirt. And so Tony asked me about Bill, and we got talking. It had me throw a couple kicks, and we hit it off right away, and and that became my friendship with Tony as well. So. Um, you know, directly or indirectly, the Superfoot connection has helped me meet so many amazing people. Uh, just blessed to have had the journey that I've had. Well, so what is, oh, go ahead, go ahead Joe. Joe. No, I was just going to say, just, you know, for the uninitiated, what is Superfoot's style? Does he have a name for his style or is it just, you know, what Superfoot. Is it from? <laughs> so Superfoot system is the, the, the style. And so he basically throughout his career adapted things to work for him. He has a degree in physiology and kinesiology. Um, so he knows why and how all the muscles work, you know, um, protagonistic, antagonistic muscle groups, the, the physiology of why the body does what it can do. So there's a lot of science behind not only his flexibility, but in the techniques, there's a psychology behind all of the techniques as well. You know, how you set the person up or trick them into something. You know, he jokes around that there's always somebody better than you. There's always somebody stronger than you. There's always somebody faster than you, but nobody ever has to be trickier than you or sneakier than you. And so a lot of his techniques are designed to all look the same at the beginning. And then they change, you know, if he chambers his leg, you don't know what kick is going to be thrown. So depending on if you're trying to hit him or block or get away, that he sort of instantaneously reacts to that. And that's what made him an undefeated world champion. Um, I've never seen anybody with his ability to read people and reflexes you know he it, if an opening is created he's already kicked it it's it's really like nobody i've ever seen um so that's pretty much superfoot system and then as one of the the longest term people i have three of my really good friends who have, who have all been in the system with me you know for over um over 20 plus years um and the three of them help me we all help each other technically we're all uh vice presidents of our particular areas of of uh, expertise i do the technical um 
the technical side of uh, supplying schools with curriculum and helping them with drills for their students, because obviously any system of martial arts could incorporate Superfoot's method of sparring. So you can overlay it on your curriculum. So it's not, it's not like we are an organization where you follow, you know, like a Krav Maga system where you do, here's your white to black belt. We do have a white to black belt, but we assume that you're training in a system of martial arts and we just layer on top of it. Here's how you use some sparring strategies and techniques. Here's how you improve your flexibility. Here's how you improve your kicking abilities. Um, and then the psychology, anatomy and physiology of why the combinations work the way they do for Bill. And then how do we... Uh, how do those of us that aren't Bill adapt them to work for us is kind of it. Yeah, those of us who are normal fit as opposed to super foot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I always say, you know, this is how Bill does it. Now, I'm not Bill, so here's how I have to change it once in a while. <laughs> but his the everything he did just kind of fit my mentality of sparring you know he jokes around that it's it's no fun when it's your turn it's only fun when it's my turn and uh you know I was never a fan of getting hit although my nose isn't straight it's it clearly happens when you're kickboxing but um it, I'd rather I'd rather be the hitter than the hit e and so the strategies of you know uh, landing a combination and getting out of the way creating distance and that I, honestly that's kind of what led to Tony and I's DVD series because when I first met Tony he was the first person to ever teach me how to get back to my feet from a grappling scenario. I had studied it, you know, in part with some of the Gracies. The first seminar I ever took was uh, in the early 90s with Hickson Gracie. It was amazing material, but they all wanted you to stay on the ground, right? And so as a kickboxer, not knowing what I'm doing on the ground, Tony was the first person that said, hey, here's here's where I want you to be able to fight. And here's how we're going to get there. And then, oh, and here's a bunch of things you can rip off on the way. And <laughs> uh, and so I thought that was, you know, some pretty amazing material. And that's one of the reasons we hit it off. And that kind of led to that four DVD set of um, me teaching some basic kickboxing, which like Tony said, it's 100 years ago. I kind of cringe when I watch it now because I was young. But um but at the same token, there's some valuable stuff there. And then Tony's ability to teach everybody what happens if they catch your foot? What happens if they clinch? What happens if they take you down? Um, having somebody solve those pieces of the puzzle was incredible because, I, like I said, I hadn't met anybody that taught it before. I, I yeah, I'm, I'm always I've always been of the belief system that, uh, you know, you work with somebody's strengths and well, and their weaknesses. But, yeah, don't abandon everything unless the guy really doesn't know anything then you form them and and go from there but like your strikes your stand-up ability is fantastic why would i say never do that again let's let's, com <laughs> let's completely stay on the ground especially in a street scenario where you don't want to be on the ground and excuse me that's part of the big thing with the crowd guys like this past weekend it was really informal um and just off the cuff you know they, they were like hey man <clears throat> these jujitsu guys do this 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 is what we we're we're dealing with and i show them ways to counter it right away and they're like this is great because they they're there's nothing wrong with jujitsu but like you mentioned there certain schools have certain focuses you know and if if it's a ground fighting school their focus is let's get it to the ground let's finish it on the ground you you may be well i want to keep it on the feet or if i'm on the ground i want to get back to my feet so i can finish and Pretty much that's the crowd guys too. They want to stay on their feet or get to their feet. And yeah, it's good that we're able to do that. Uh, and I think, I mean, it, to be fair, I think a lot of the jujitsu programs have come a long way since we first met and we're, you know, it was more uh, closed minded and almost cultish back in the day. Oh, you yeah. know, um, we have a jujitsu program in our school and I love everybody in it. And, and, um, you know, I've met a lot of coaches now that through cross training have learned a lot of the things that you showed me, but I will always kind of go back to that and just say, hey, you know, Tony was a pioneer. Tony's the one that really first introduced me to this material. And I'm still a huge fan of, of the way Catch does all of the um, the locks and breaks and all that stuff. Um, you know, still, it, again, it kind of fit me, right? It was something that super foot fit my stand-up abilities. And then I had a black belt in Japanese jiu-jitsu under Michael Di Pasquale. And so Tony, your material really fit right into that and gave me uh, a lot of tools that I didn't have in that capacity as well. So How's uh, Mike very doing? thankful. How's Mike uh, doing? He's got a lot of um, health issues. He had a training accident and he needed neck surgery. And oh. then, um, and then, 
something went wrong and he went back in for another neck surgery and then he was paralyzed from the waist down when he came out of the hospital. Um, so he's, uh, he's improving. He's, he's been a couple of years of physical therapy and he's getting some feeling back in his toes and he can walk with a walker, but, um, he's in, he's in kind of rough shape at the moment. It's really sad. Well, you tell him, I give him my best regards. You know, he was very pleasant to me when I met him and everything. And just, yeah, he, another- he the world to you. Yeah, same here. And it's not even just an Italian thing, but that always adds to it, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, it does, let's face it. But uh, yeah, he was, see, I was always like East Coast minded, right? Um, it's kind of weird being gro- uh, born and raised in Cleveland. I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm just weird that way, but I don't remember us ever being like pounded with the, you're a Midwestern state. It just never worked that way with us because we always felt more like the East Coast because we are the last stop before the East Coast, technically, okay? Uh, <laughs> Pennsylvania starts the, the geographic East Coast. So all of our rivalries um, were East Coast related. Pittsburgh Steelers, you know, uh, what do you call it? Yankees, Red Sox. Uh, all of that was our, we yeah, we played the White Sox, Chicago White Sox, but we never, eh, there was nothing with them. It was nothing with the Bears. So I always got, I got this East Coast mentality like you guys have. And uh, I always enjoyed my trips out to the East Coast just because of that, you know, um, because I fit right in. New York, all the way up the Eastern Seaboard there. We've always had fun. Met a bunch of characters. Uh, I had some great stories. And I miss a lot of people from out there. Uh, Just, you know, Ryan Chamberlain. And, uh, you know, we were were talking about... uh, we had a guest on a couple of weeks ago, three weeks, four weeks ago. I mentioned Ed Marini. How's Ed Marini doing? You know? Uh, yeah, no clue. <laughs> yeah, see, people, time, life goes on, you know. Um, I still well, no, see you know, Steve all the time. I, have, I haven't seen Ed since probably the last seminar uh, that we did. <laughs> so it's been a long time. He kind oh, of that's got to be, well, I haven't seen Ed. It, it's got to be close to 20 years, years now. Yeah. The easy, easy 20 years. Another guy I haven't seen. Remember Tony Anisi? I do. Yeah. How's he doing? Uh, he's fine. I talk to him every once in a while, but um, not, say hello not for me. typically in the same circles. So yeah, but say hello to me for, or say hello to him for me, because when we would get together, when we would do the mass seminars out there, um, you know, the big group seminars, he, him and I always pal, you know, talked and, um, you know, it was just one of those things. And, and I'll level with you, you know, at times, especially in the beginning, I kind of felt like an outsider because I'm not, uh, it's weird. We've talked about this before, maybe not with you, but growing up, boxing, wrestling, which is what I really like more than anything, um, they were never considered martial arts whatsoever at all, period, end of story, right? <laughs> so now, of course, they're integral parts of uh, mixed martial arts. and right. It, it, and it's gotten its, you know, it's due in that regard. But the guys that you know, um, Hanchi and all of those guys, you know, uh, Jeff Driscoll, you know, Bernie, these are all martial art guys to me, like and experts at the highest level of their style. And and it just like I back then, especially, I didn't feel like I kind of felt like I fit in, you know. But you certainly made me feel welcome. Bill Wallace always made me feel welcome. Him and I were always joking around. Um, yeah, Bill, Bill says hi, by the way. I told him that uh, I was talking to you this week because he was out at the school all weekend. So. Great. Yeah, we'd love to have him as a guest, too. He's just, Joe, sure. you need to meet this guy in person. He's uh, I, he's the epitome of what a martial artist should be. Um, and, and the thing about Bill, now I haven't seen him in a decade but it doesn't matter exactly Even when same. I saw him the last time he weighed the same as, as when he was fighting. Yeah. He, he lives the lifestyle. I try to do that as well. Sometimes, you know, like injuries, age catch up, catches up to you somewhat, but um, no, he's the epitome of what I believe a martial artist should be. And I think, I, I don't know, Chuck Norris and him, maybe Jim Kelly who passed away. Those are probably the three biggest, American names that I could think of when I was a kid growing up. Uh, you know, this is before Segal or Jeff Speakman, you know, um, before they, nobody ever heard of them when I was a kid. 
you know, in the movies. So Bill's a legend is what I'm getting at. Yeah, he's unbelievable. He's the same today as he was last time you saw him. You know, when he was in Chicago, we went to uh, uh, Old Town and, you know, he went to Second City. You know, he, you know, he was tight with John Belushi. Uh, you know, that that was a tragic ending. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we've seen some of the sites in Chicago. He's just a great guy. Um, I look, I look forward to seeing him again. I, I miss him. I, I just miss his presence. It's got nothing let's to do get with you, Let's get you back out here in April, Tony. We talked about yeah. it last year, I think. And then uh, you had There's, some stuff with your mom. And Yeah, it you know. just never was possible. Now, you know, um, well, let's see what, again, I was r- raring to go. Now, I, I don't know what's up. I got to have a discussion with the nursing home today regarding my mother. I don't know what, what they're, what's happening here. So, but if, if she, you know, stays in a nursing home, then yeah, um, love to come out. It'd be great. Uh, and uh, give me something to look forward to, but getting back to you, you know, you stand on your own two feet. That's great. I mean, yeah, you're a Bill Wallace protege, but you'd have been a success with or without Bill Wallace, because you just have that natural ability. You have the mindset. And you're not another one of these guys that's more than a tough guy. You're a great coach. You you have uh, an ability to reach people. Um, that you know, and you're calm. You're another. You're another one. It reminds me of my guy Bruce Lee. That that's on the Lost Star of the Hooking. Bruce is like you in that regard. Very calm. Like you know, it's like a meditation session. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whereas I'm a bundle of energy. <laughs> I'm all high strung and shit. Um, you're not, you're really relaxing and, uh, you're, uh, I cannot, you're, I just highly recommend everybody to go train with you, even if they don't live out in, in, uh, Manchester or Nashua or any, you know, anywhere out there, just make a trip out there, be worth it. Um, maybe people can go do a little East coast tour, see some of Boston, Cape Cod, (laughs) stop at your school. I'm serious. Well, the, you know, one of the, the really cool things, too, about what, what we get to do with Bill um, every day now is that with all the Superfoot School affiliates, you know, we're setting up different seminars and testings all over the country. So um, I've literally this year, you know, been to in the last month, I've been to Denver, Reno. <laughs> it's like we're traveling all over the place. We have a guy in Chicago um, as well that's a half keto guy, but he's a Superfoot black belt. And we're probably going to set up an event there next year in 2023 so hopefully that'll um, give us a chance to reconnect when i get up there um, who is he because i'll who is he maybe i know him uh tim why am i spacing his last name now that you're putting me on the spot um well, I'll tell me later. yeah yeah um yeah so you'll probably watch the podcast and be upset i can't think of the well, last is name is he before. actually in <laughs> chicago or is he one of the yeah. suburbanite probably suburban i'm not oh. sure um yeah, I don't. I'm not. Gonna, I don't want to look it up. I, you, I get Zoom on my phone, and I look everything up on my phone. <laughs> oh, I see. Because yeah, because a lot of people will say I'm not suggesting this. He's guilty of this, but people will say Chicago, but but really they're they're three hours away or something. Yeah, yeah I, don't, yeah, I have no clue. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, but no, I mean, but I can't I can't brag about you enough, and just you're and you're a great friend. I mean, you've been there for me when I was in the hospital. You were actually in the room. I remember this much of it i don't remember a lot but i remember you were there when we got the bad news from the one doctor i mean when you go when you yeah when you go through things like that with somebody like i do with you it's a bond and it's tim harrison by the way i got yeah i I don't know him um (laughs) sorry tim if you're watching tim (laughs) what what happens with with a lot of people is and i got a friend like this who feels that you got to have this constant contact you always got to stay in touch. That's what, you know, you, you, if you let it go, you lose your friendship. And that's not true. You know, like you and I, we're picking things up today, just like we saw each other last week. It's like no yeah. big deal. That's the test of true friendship and always trying to be there for one another uh, when the chips are down, uh, you know, if you can. Yeah, I mean, uh, there was no doubt, you know, you you called me and told me the, the news that you're in the hospital and I just jumped on a plane and came out, you know. It's, yeah, you so did. That was a long that was 20 years ago. That was for sure was. 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. And that was here in Chicago. And that was a year of in and out of hospitals for me. But I got to tell you, man, 
not a lot of people would do that. And you, you stayed at the room. I mean, it was like, was, well, I had nowhere else to go. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. I mean, but no, you're just a wonderful, I can't endorse you enough. I just really wish people would, would, would you oh, know, likewise, Tony, you know, yeah, no, I, I really want people to train with you and get to know you. Um, and yeah, and everybody you've introduced me to that I can remember, like my, my, my memory's really not what it was, uh, but I do certain things stick out in certain people and everyone you've met or introduced me to have just been great people. I, I'm lucky that way. I'm lucky. Like you were lucky. You said you met Bill. I'm lucky to meet you and Bill Wallace and people like that. I'm blessed. Yeah, man. Well, likewise, you know, so you're the man. So happy that we've had this this time together. And uh, like I said, I still to this day, you know, every once in a while, our jujitsu coach will have to go coach a wrestling meet or something. And he'll be like, hey, you want to sub in and and show some of Tony's stuff? And so just kind of get him in a position and go over, you know, top wrist lock or something with everybody. And um, just because it's still my favorite material on the planet. So. <laughs> Well, tell us a little more or tell everybody a little bit more about your school. Well, obviously, afterwards, Joe will put all the information on the YouTube channel so people can. Uh, but what hours of operation? Where are you located? What's the class schedule? So on. Uh, see if I can get it all off the top of my head. We're in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, it's called the Training Station. Um, and it's a, we have an 8,000 square foot facility, the boxing ring, weight area, locker rooms, showers. Um, and then honestly, over the last couple of years, because I've been in town, uh, next year will be 30 years that I've been open. Um, the training station, was, we partnered with my wife, and that was 12 years ago. Um, but in the last couple of years with COVID and all the different things, because I've you know, been friends with so many people around town, I've, I've gotten the opportunity to bring in a lot of really great instructors you know, some of them that had programs at different uh, places or owned their own places and then uh, just decided, you know, that paying rent and doing all that stuff themselves was harder than just coming over and running a program with me. So we have, uh, you know, I have my kickboxing classes, which are, you know, super foot. And then my wife does kickboxing boot camp classes and fitness classes. We have a boxing coach. We have a Brazilian jiu-jitsu coach. We have a judo coach, we have a small circle jiu-jitsu coach. We have Kempo classes. Um, man, I, I don't know. I'm sure I left somebody out of the mix, but uh, we've just tried, uh, we have an Aikido program a couple of days a week. Uh, my training partner is a Savat guy from, uh, from Italy and his name is Gino Travolano. He's amazing. He's one of the highest ranked Savat people in the country and he happens to live in my town. So we kick each other every weekend for a couple hours. And um, so it's just, it's, it's great, man. You know, after 30 years of being in business, it's really nice to have found open-minded, like-minded martial artists that are at the gym as a community and not, you know, um, self-centered about their program or what art's the best or come train with me. You know, everybody's, everybody wants everybody to train with each other and learn. Um, everybody's a really talented coach and respects each other. So it's a lot of fun, man. We have a, we have a really cool facility. See that that's, I wish I could be a part of it. If I lived out there, I'd be there, you know. <laughs> You've been to the training station. So oh, I don't oh well yeah. well yeah. Uh, and that reminds me now. I now I know the last time I was out there, because I think it was r either right before no, it had to be right after my shoulder surgery in 2009, because I got the massage session from hell. I remember that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, that's like the only like bad, bad memory that I have. Was, uh, and it was like, I knew I was in trouble when she said, you're not, this is deep tissue. I'm like, hey, man, I'm injured here. Don't, don't do it. And when she did it, I mean, the very next day, I guys, I had a coach and I literally couldn't lift my arms up. I mean, I'm like, I was in so much agony. Yeah, because it was all torn up my, my whole, yeah, it was right after I did the snap, no tap, because I injured my arm preparing for that video shoot so i like a couple of weeks before the video shoot so i couldn't get the surgery until after the video shoot um which was in november of 2008 and the, the soonest the surgery could be scheduled was february of 2009 
So it was somewhere in between those times, but yeah. Um, well, even uh, even during catch and kickboxing, you were you were having some physical problems. I had lost my voice from the weekend of seminars. So yeah. it's kind of a it's a funny series. Like we're both not a hundred percent, but uh, but managed to get it done and get the material out. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's just the thing. You're not always going to be in top condition. It's not like a you know, if you were a football player or a box, you know, competitor, you, you cancel the event, right? You postpone it. We can't, you got to show up. Uh, <laughs> when I did the snap, no tap, I had broken my hip earlier. I didn't tell the Paladin press any of this because they'd have freaked out. I'm like, I'm a professional. I I'll get through it. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I look forward to coming back out there and, you know, give people, you know, New Hampshire. A lot of people may not have been in New Hampshire course i have but give us geographically Man manchester to let's say the distance from manchester to boston manchester to new york city just to give people an idea where this is at geographically sure well uh new hampshire is sort of in between maine and massachusetts um we only have like 20 miles of coastline um to get to the ocean uh so manchester we have our own airport um that it, it's about 50 minutes or so from boston like just under an hour uh, I can get to New York City in about four and a half hours if I don't hit traffic. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's that's pretty much it, man. We're we're just a little little state up here kind of hidden away. You know, I used to train a bunch of the guys in New York. There was a little crew. They called themselves the Dungeon Crew. Uh, and uh, New York, New York. Right. So um, and I, I haven't seen those guys in a long time. You know, New York was through a lot with 9-11 and then life with people goes on. And I just, I miss a lot of that East Coast stuff. Um, just, I remember, uh, oh, here's a funny story. I don't know how this happened. We were doing a, a seminar by you. I, I was doing a seminar with by you, but I don't know if you went with us on lunch break, but the guys took me into this pizzeria by you. OK. And man, huh, the minute I walked in there, one of the crew said that told the, the owner that I'm from Chicago and man, this guy tore into me. I mean, he's like, yeah, your pizza shit out there. Where do you taste this? Da, 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 da. I'm like, oh, my goodness. What did I walk into here? It's a pizza war. All right. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, it was it was, it was funny. But it was very good pizza. I, you know, I'm used to a different type of pizza out here. But I just found that the, the guy was like really serious. And I'm like, dude, I'm thinking, I'm not here to judge your pizza. I'm just hungry. You know, <laughs> I want to eat. You know, that's yeah. you say, you know, your catch wrestling sucks. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I don't care. Say, you can say anything. Just give me the pizza. I'm hungry. Yeah. You know? <laughs> what do you got to say, Joe? Well, um, a yeah, the rest of the country does. I think suffer from pizza insecurity when someone from chicago shows up i can see that happening uh but you know it's just something we have to live with when we go elsewhere um but beyond that i, I wish i'd asked this question earlier terry but so what's fascinating to me is you, you, you sparred with superfoot is there can you describe what that's like uh to get in the ring with someone like that like what was it like were you ever <laughs> able to get like anywhere close to him <laughs> you know things like that <laughs> yeah i think like a lion playing with a kitten um yeah i mean he's just unbelievable so obviously he was training me and so you know you he doesn't doesn't really let you do anything but he lets you live um you know <laughs> and, man i mean i i think i got in one or two shots in the month that we trained and the and the the moment right after that was probably the most scary time because you got to see him react as a fighter to something happening in real time that really his reactions aren't necessarily something he has control over right you know when you're you're sparring and playing around you kind of uh, picking and choosing what you want to do and when you want to do it and then I think I, I landed a kick and kind of fell forward from it and his counter hook kick hit me before I could blink like I never saw the thing you know I just remember thinking thank god I had my hands up because the kick sent me about 10 feet backwards and he stopped he's like oh my god are you okay and I was like I had my hands up I was so proud you know but i just remember thinking like good lord you know just imagine 
if that was coming at you all the time, if that, you know, that, that instinct, that reaction, that speed that he had is honestly like nothing that I've ever experienced. And, you know, I could do nothing about his jab, which to this day, uh, I still can't touch it. I mean, it's ridiculous that how sneaky and fast it is. And, you know, part of it is he throws the jab kind of like um, Ali or Mayweather with the lead hand down. And so when you're sparring a boxer that has their hands up and they throw the jab, you see the thing from before it starts to, you know, the whole time. With the superfoot jab, with the hand down, it's not in your vision. So the way he just kind of snaps it out and back, you don't see it start. So you only have the reaction at the last second to it. And he's so quick that there's not much you can do about it. And then when you're that frustrated by just the basics of the jab, he's already set his kicking techniques up. He's already, while you're defending the jab, he's already slid up and chambered the leg to kick and then picks a target. So um, futile would be a word that comes to mind. <laughs> but I mean, I think the, the thing that I like to always talk about because, you know, understand that he was uh, a high school wrestler, a collegiate wrestler, and then he, he played judo for the first part of his martial arts career. So quite honestly, he was one of the first mixed martial artists before UFC came out and did all that stuff. And of course, you know, we're talking to Tony earlier about reading comments and, and things that kind of drive us nuts. I often see people talk about how, you know, oh, it's the lead leg. It doesn't have any power and this and that. And it's like, man, if you watch some of the early fights that he did in kickboxing when, when throwing was allowed and you watch those people get to a clinch and they get thrown before they ever realize what happened to them, you know, his judo days, he just senses or feels a shift or movement and reacts to it. So his judo is, is as fast and sneaky as his kickboxing. And so, I mean, I've been thrown multiple times and had no idea, like just a minute ago, you were out here where we were punching and kicking and now I'm on my back. You know, so I like to kind of dispel the thing that he's just sort of a lead leg point sparring kicker. I mean, he had 13 knockouts with a sidekick. He did three professional boxing matches and he won all three with a left hook knockout. So, I mean, you know, the, the man's unbelievable. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to go back to the sparring, uh, I, I will treasure those moments for the rest of my life. Uh, they were very painful. You know, the first day I showed up in L.A. and we sparred, I honestly thought when I was getting in my car, I was like, maybe I'll get a flight home tomorrow. I mean, it was, it was just so, uh, it was so painful. And I felt like I was just a, a white belt kid again. And I had been doing martial arts for, you know, over a decade. And I was like, man, if that's the way it's going to be every day, if he's just going to beat the shit out of me, there's no point in doing this. And then it was kind of like the first day was to kind of put you in place and show you the ground floor, you know, and then he did a good job building me up over the month. And then, uh, and then on the last day, he reminded me that I was on the ground floor. So <laughs> <laughs> um, he's just one of those guys that, you know, if, if he's working out with you, if, if he's working with somebody in a seminar and you manage to pull something off, um, he loves that competition, man. You're his partner until he, he figures out the puzzle and gets you back. Um, you know, he used to travel the country, stopping in every karate school he passed and asking if there was anybody he could spar. We were talking the other day and I said, man, you must have sparred 100,000 people in your life. And he said, yeah, it's probably about that. So just imagine there, there's nothing he hasn't seen, no matter what style you are, no matter what guard you have, no matter what technique you think you're going to do, he's sparred 100,000 people. There, there's just not that many options. So he knows just by looking at you what options you have, if you're squared up, if you're sideways, if your hands are up, if your hands are down, if you level changed for a shot, just literally by looking at your body mechanics, he already knows what you're going to do. And then by reacting to your movement, he knows when you're going to do it. So what on earth do you do about somebody that knows what and when you're going to do? You know, it's, it's like nothing I've ever experienced. Yeah. He's a, he's a whirlwind, man. He's a sensation. And I think the big thing too, is he's always kept active. He's kept himself in shape, um, yep. which is half the battle, you know, yeah. and uh, you know, but getting back to the comments, you know, you and I, well, I'm sure you were, I know I was really at the, for to be the almost like the beginnings of the internet um, yeah <laughs> and you know and you, you just have to walk away from it but because the the comments are just you know many times just either ridiculous positive or ridiculous negative but it, i've come to learn it's i don't go to these i don't surf the web like that but it's any subject matter it's no longer it's not all martial art thing it's any topic yeah of course um 
Yeah, because sometimes I'll I'll go to YouTube just for music to listen to music. And by the way, Terry's a great drummer. Um, but to listen to music, and you'll sometimes read comments. Uh, I'm like, man, these people just really are are, are clueless. You know, yeah. I mean, like, where are they coming from? Where, where are they coming with this shit? They, you know, they come um, from an era where they, they didn't get punched in the mouth for talking to somebody in person. <laughs> well, you, know? you mentioned earlier that uh, Javier Palomo, one of my world champions, he's a great guy. He uh, he said the same thing that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu now, because I've, I, I've been out of the loop taking care of my mom for almost a decade. You know, he's like, uh, they're much more open-minded than when I used to have to deal with it. Um, and you made that same comment, which is, which is good because um, they needed to stay open-minded and develop and grow. Uh, and I, and I'm glad that that's, that you're also confirming that even out there on the East coast, it, it isn't just a local Chicago thing, but they're more open-minded out on the East. Well, coast. You know, so our, our, uh, we're affiliated with a guy named Luigi Mondelli out of Connecticut. He's America top team, but um, he's good friends with my friend, Walt Lysak and Walt's dad was a catch wrestler. So when, uh, when Walt and I teach together and I go over some of your stuff, he gets all excited. He's like, Oh my God, that looks like what my dad showed me. And so he's really, really looking forward to meeting you too, when you come out. So, you know, all of that's just kind of mixed into the culture of um, at, at least, you know my team and and our affiliates it's all uh it all kind of ties back to some sort of catch i couldn't tell you beyond his dad who his dad learned from um I had too many things in my brain and i forget to ask questions or then i forget the answer but <laughs> well you know and this is not about his dad because i don't know the family i've heard the name walt lysak um but way back you know there weren't many sports you know the boxing wrestling you know football was a collegiate sport i mean there wasn't even a pro football league until the 20s so uh yeah i mean everybody dabbled in some stuff everyone that i knew growing up as a kid all these old timers my grandparents age they were all they all boxed a little my grandfather was a you know pro boxer but a lot of them all all they all dabbled in boxing and I'm sure that um, wrestling too, you know, uh, I met guys growing up that, you know, said they did a little wrestling. Uh, it wasn't real sophisticated or anything, but they had exposure to it. So, yeah. Um, and then also remember Terry, uh, and this may apply to Walt's dad. I don't know the man, but um, a lot of these soldiers coming back from World War II, you know, they learned some hand to hand in, in training. Uh, and I remember a lot of the old timers showing me stuff, how to get out of a full Nelson or whatever, you know, how to trip a guy from a handshake and just stuff like that, that, you know, um, so I, I guess my point is that America has had a history and maybe it's an unwritten history, but of martial arts uh, or, or, or mixed fighting. Like there were many boxers that also wrestled and wrestlers who turned to pro boxing or were good amateur boxers like Danny Hodge um, or Paul Berlinbach, who was a, a national AAU wrestling champion who, who ended up becoming the, the, the light heavyweight boxing champion of the world. Okay. This is going way back to the twenties and thirties and shit. So here's a guy who was the best light heavyweight boxer in the world and was the best wrestler in his weight division in the country. That's a guy who knows how to fight all right so i think a lot of times people forget that america has a rich history so when you tell me something like walt lysak's dad or somebody else says my dad learned this or that i believe it because it's been it's been around a lot longer than people want to want to sometimes admit absolutely but even going back to the 20s nobody combined the looks and the physique and the the sculpture awesomeness of a joe cardinal that's never existed not only in this country, but anywhere else. Let's talk about yourself, Joe. You're really good at that. I'm, I'm glad we finally got around to what everybody wants to hear about on this podcast. So glad we, I guess we let it build up, you know, with all the super foot talk. Now we can talk about me. So, um, but yeah, well, that's, we'll save that for like episode like 300 or something, the big finale. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's interesting style stylistically because I don't know much about the superfoot system. Obviously, everybody's familiar with his crazy flexibility and head kicks and things. Does he incorporate things like leg kicking as well and things of that nature, or does he use that to set up the head kicks? 
Yeah, I mean, he'll talk a little bit about, you know, uh, like what's allowed now. He'll, he'll talk about self-defense for like a sidekick to the knee. He'll address <laughs> leg kicks if you uh, if you ask him, you know, uh, how do you defend against a leg kick? And I mean, some of that is as easy as the timing of, you know, not allowing someone to step in and throw it, like, you know, the distance between us. So it's definitely addressed and talked about, you know, typically when he's teaching, you're trying to learn his techniques the way that he wants you to learn them and then he kind of addresses all other questions you know i've done uh, a few series on um on how to how to deal with leg kicks just you know not anything i published publicly but you know we'll have fighters that are in our organization and they'll they'll send me a message say hey i'm going to be fighting this thai guy can you give me any tips and you know my training partner gino is a, a savat master and there's a, a substantial amount of leg kicks and targeting nerves in the legs and so it's been really fun over the last few years of him and I sparring to um, to figure out, you know, how to use what I do to to not let my front leg get beat up. You know, we're sideways, so you can't reach my back leg. Um, so you're really only going to beat up my front leg. And if, you know, if you kick the hamstring side of the front leg, I can pick it up and throw a side kick or a hook kick while you're kicking my leg. If you're throwing the kick towards the knee side, then I obviously have to be really careful. It's either a matter of using a, a striking, you know, hand hand combination to negate the kick power to the, the leg or changing angles or getting out of there. You know, there's really no leg checking. Um, obviously, we might have to leg check something at some point other than just eating a leg kick. But I I focus a lot on timing and distancing to where I intercept if you're if you're if, a, if you're a good leg kicker, you're probably setting it up with your hands. You're not just stepping up and trying to kick me in the leg. If you're going to step up and kick me in the leg, I'm going to hit you first. I mean, that's just the plan, right? I, there's no reason for me to counter something when I can hit you first. Um, and then it's a matter of, you know, if they're throwing a combination jab, cross, cut, kick, something like that, then we want to deal with that combination back at the jab, cross. I don't want to wait until you're kicking me in the leg. Right. So it's a really big topic and it's obviously something everybody's interested in. And it's obviously something that we always hear the internet warriors critiquing, you know, well, if leg kicks were allowed, leg kicks were allowed when Superfoot started doing this, you know, watch the 74 world championships, the guy from Germany kicks Bill in the leg and he knocks him out with a hook kick off the very same motion. So um, it's just a matter of timing and distancing, reading your opponent, making sure that um, we put ourselves in a position to not take that damage to the front side of the knee um so i don't know if that answers your question at all uh but yeah i mean we're we're a completely sideways system but you can transition in and out of that from forward you know if you throw a jab it's not that hard to just continue on to sideways while you're throwing a jab to set up your sidekicks and your other techniques well, um I, these internet people like this comment you know about well if they allowed leg kicks and even if they didn't you know <laughs> it's a sport I, you know, I used to tell people like, cause I, I used to love to play football. I was a wide receiver and a rover back. And I'm like, when I was playing defense, I'm like, you know, literally if I was able to tackle a receiver before the ball got there, they'd never catch a pass. Okay. It'd right. be impossible because you're, right. you're wiping out the receivers before you can get, get the ball to them. So they make the rule that you can't touch them until the ball makes contact with the receiver. And that's the thing. Same with grappling. I can watch a, an event and say, well, if you, if the rules allow this, the, the, this grappler would be finished. You can always play that what if stuff. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's good. You know, it really is. It'll start to develop your mind when it's used constructively. But when it's used to destruct somebody, like to just say, oh, well, this guy has no, everything he does is worthless because they don't leg kick or, yeah. you know, they, they don't defend against bites. That's bullshit. <laughs> you know, but I love it. I mean, that's one of my favorite things about sparring with Gino is because he's such a master of, of kicking and targeting legs. You know, it really gave me the opportunity to see how a masterful person approaches leg kicks and then gives me the opportunity to, to work on that and play with that and get out of the way and use my techniques. And I mean, that's the fun, right? As we as we get older. Well, we're, I'm not training to be in another world championships, but I want to stay in shape and I want to uh, I want to have the answers to the questions. You know, as a good coach, uh, I'd like to at least be able to say, hey, here's some here's some ways that we deal with it. You know, maybe I want to focus on the area that I'm the best at, but um, sure. uh, we're, we're all open minded to 
to everything. And I mean, Tony's got the, you know, the master of street fighting and, and catch. So, I mean, we all, we've all got our friends that I just defer people to if they want more information on it, you know? Yeah. And I, I mean, I, as I've gotten older and with the health, you know, my body just aching and breaking, you know, I, I rely more on my boxing now. I mean, if I were, you know, in fights, I've always want in a street fight, I've always wanted to strike to begin with. I don't want to go entangle myself on the ground and Lord knows what I can run into there, you know, getting knifed or shot, you know, you know how that goes, but, uh, but it is great when you have that and you're in a vibrant area, it appears where you, you have these great, uh, martial artists around you. And, um, that's one of the biggest things that I miss where I live now. I'm so far away. Uh, I'm not part of any community per se. Uh, and again, out here going to be nine years in a couple of months, in a few months, uh, that's a long time to be away from the city. And even the last year that I lived in the city, you know, I wasn't really doing much. You know what I'm saying? I didn't get, I didn't have that community, you know, 10, 12 years ago. It was, it was a different thing, but if I lived in Chicago now, I'd be hanging out at Bender's or I'd be going to the, the Krav Maga school just to hang out, you know, even if it's once a week you need a school just to hang out uh and, and work out a little bit or watch people i yeah i miss that you know so i give bill credit and you that you've you've created a uh business opportunity that allows him to do that i don't have the opportunities you know business wise you know to do that it isn't um financially feasible just to start driving you know a round trip 100 miles with tolls every day just to hang around and watch somebody you know work out like this you know doesn't work <laughs> out that way for me so um but no i'm just i'm so pleased i know we got to get wrapped up because we're actually filming this today people uh tuesday morning very early before joe goes to work and terry because we, scheduling is sometimes hard for guests but we'd love to have you back on we'd love to have bill on we just i can't wait to come out there and see you again i feel be sure great, Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I just happened to glance at my phone, not to be rude or anything, but I just wanted to see if I got an email response um, from the nursing home, which I don't, it's one minute before 9 a.m. here now where I'm at. So I don't recall if the nursing home opened at eight, the business part of it, or nine, but I have not gotten a response. So I've got to get a hold of the nursing home to find out what's going on with my mom here. And yeah, as long as she's still taken care of, I'll have the luxury and the ability to uh, to travel. Um, so yeah, if it's April, let's let's just see how this plays out. But certainly, I'll let you know what's coming down the pike here. Uh, I'll text you guys actually later today when when I get some information. Um, yeah, that'd be great, man. And we can uh, we can talk, you know, off off video about all the different things that are going on and how we can oh, help yeah, each other right. and uh, get back involved. Yeah, I need something to uh, yeah to get back involved. Even something I need something often. I don't mean like every day, seven days a week, but you know, I just gotta get. I gotta worry about me now, kind of. And uh, I do have a doctor's appointment tomorrow, so uh, I did that just a follow up, and then I got I got the big doctor that's not until january 30th like three months from now um uh that's the big one so uh we'll see how that all pans out but uh but yeah i guess we should wrap this up so everybody can get about their business joe as always thanks for co-hosting i i hope we can get nico back when nico's again nico's life is uh you know i gotta talk to him to see how he's doing but you tell everybody out there on the east coast that tony says hello I miss them. I miss everyone. And I would love to just be able to, if I come out there, of course, teach, but I would love to just socialize, you know, just hang out and have like a big hangout with the group, you know? That <laughs> sounds good to me, man. I can't wait. All right, then, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next week. Um, and we'll be on Sunday. So that'll be a good thing. Thank you.